Hi, I'm Carl Taylor. Welcome to our uh, monthly, weekly little chat here on social media with you guys. Um, I'm going to do another Q&A session today as well as catch up with you about a few things that we've been up to and uh, seeing. We went to Photokina in Germany, uh, which I'm going to talk about as well, talk about some of the things we saw there. Uh, if you've got any photography related questions that you'd like answered, I'll do my best. Remember, I'm not going to be too keen on the gear questions like which lens is better than this lens, etc, etc. When you're asking specific model lenses and stuff like that. I don't really deal with selling equipment or that sort of thing. I'm not a, you know, we're more about photography as an art, as a form. So if you're looking for tips on photography, fire them in. But gear specific questions, not really our thing. Go and check out some of the other vloggers for that stuff. This is where photography happens, not techie geek git stuff. Right, now, um, fire questions in. I'll pick them up on this iPad. We're hopefully getting questions in from both social media channels. And I'll, uh, we'll spend about 15 minutes on uh, questions if we get uh, enough questions in. Now let's start off and tell you a few things about what's been going on here. Um, we were in Photokina. Now, if those of you who don't know, Photokina is the world's biggest photography trade show. It's held once every two years. It's like the Olympics of photography trade shows. It's over several huge halls on two levels and all the big exhibitors, you know, your Canons, your Nikons, Olympus, Hasselblad, uh, everyone, all the lighting companies, Pro Photo, Broncolor, they're all there, everyone's there. Everyone's got these huge elaborate stands. I mean, the Canons Hall was massive. It was one whole hall. It was completely all in black with these amazing huge television screens and guest speakers and kit and all their latest new mirrorless cameras, all that stuff. Huge stuff, great to see. Uh, the sad thing about Photokina is that this year is the last year that it's going to be once every two years. Next year, it switches to a um, once every year, a yearly and an annual model. And the fear is from a lot of people in the industry that I was talking to, that was Photo Kina was gonna become like an annual sort of German trade show. Cause this thing's held in Germany in the city of Cologne every two years. And now it's gonna be held every year. And I think it's gonna scale down and it's not gonna be quite as international. Now, um, some may argue it's a good thing. Some may argue it's a bad. I personally haven't made my mind up yet. I kind of find trade shows are sort of dying a death in many ways that a lot of the times, all the information you can find out about the latest products we find out online and through vlogging sites or people like us, etc. So, you know, maybe the relevance isn't quite there, but I do enjoy them for a day or two looking around. They can be quite overwhelming. Um, I actually did a talk on the Manfrotto stand and uh, did a really good talk about photography and inspiration and uh, finding your skill set in photography. And uh, it was so popular, that talk, that what we decided to do, if you, if you want to try and catch it, it's on our Facebook page, you have to go back in the history, but we're going to do that talk again. I'm going to do it live on uh, YouTube, hopefully in the next few weeks, where we'll get an audience uh, in, you know, invite people in to look at it and also online. And I'm, I'm going to do this talk because I think it really helped people with their photography. I think there's some really key factors in that talk that people will find useful. So look out for that. That will be uh, coming soon. I'm also gonna to talk to you about some of the products that we saw at Photokina. So let me start off with that because I've been sent a couple of things here. Um, the first and most simple one is this. I went over to Lee Filters. You know Lee Filters, they make uh, camera filters. So these are things like neutral density filters. Can you see that? Yeah, you see the graduated filters. So it's darker at the top, blocks out the light from the sky so that you get a, a, a balance of exposure between your foreground and your uh, sky exposure. Now the problem with these, when I'm shooting with these, especially down by the coast, doing sea, seascapes is sea spray in windy or rough conditions gets all over these. And I normally have to have spare ones and I keep swapping, I'm pouring a bottle of water and I'm wiping uh, with a cloth and stuff. And um, what they've come up with, because they, they know that a lot of their photographers have this problem, is they've got some new uh, special cleaning cloths, which is great, but these things are no good with salt water, you just smear it all around. But they've come up with this brand new cleaning solution called Clearly. And they say that it's a special 
formulation they've created because they've got their own labs and chemistry and everything else. It's uh, not toxic, but it's, um, you know, you wouldn't want to drink it, obviously. But um, this stuff apparently is super good at removing salt water spray. So if you're a landscape photographer, uh, you're out in the drizzle, the rain, or you're out at the coast with sea spray, you spray this stuff onto your filter, and this stuff apparently will superbly remove salt water stains, any other type of stains, and get rid of it straight away. Whoops. So I'm looking forward to testing that out properly in the field, and I will report back to you on how well it performs. But um, I know the guys at Lee, they're good guys. They said this stuff, they're really happy with uh, how this works and what their chemists have formulated here. So uh, look out for that if you're a landscape photographer. Now, something else uh, someone sent to me was this thing called the Litra Pro bi-color LED light. There's, there's the brochure. There's, there's, there's the brochure, there's the inside. It all looks very flash and very cool. It's claiming it's the world's first full spectrum compact LED light. And <coughs> well, that's quite a claim because I did see some other full spectrum LED lights at Photokina. They weren't uh, as compact as this. But I want to talk to you about the advantages and benefits of this because these guys spoke to me a while and they asked my opinion about this light and I gave them my feedback about these type of lights. Let me just show you this unit first of all. So here's the unit. It is very compact. Turn it on. There you can see, super, super bright. Uh, it's actually... How many lumens? 1200 lumen. And you can vary the color temperature. Let me just see, yeah, it's this one. You can vary the color temperature from like cold uh, to, uh, sorry, warm to cold. I'm making it colder now, so it's going bluer. So it's got a variable color temperature range and it's got a variable brightness range as well. So uh, quite an impressive little unit, comes with a, ball mount uh, attachment so you can mount it on the hot shoe of your camera uh, but the problem with this for me as I explained to them when uh, they asked my opinion about it was that it's just like a speed light in many ways in terms of the quality of the light that it can output okay remember that the quality of the light isn't just about the full spectrum or the color balance obviously that's important that's why we use flash or HMI for pure color and if this has got a good color index, then great. But the quality of the light is your ability to modify the light. And it's very difficult to modify light that comes from a flat panel because you cannot really do much with the light other than diffuse it, possibly in a softbox or through a scrim. If you wanna use it in an umbrella or a para, as I'll demonstrate in a second, this won't work because it has a flat surface and light to work in a parabolic reflector has to emanate out from all directions from the point light source. And they do have a diffusion cover from it, but that doesn't do a great deal in making the light go out sideways. So this thing is limited, okay? It's fine as a little hard light, directional light source. So if you wanna pop up a couple of these in different places, small compact things, but they're always gonna give you a hard aggressive light unless you soften the light. And that's not great, okay? That is not a great look to your light. So all this stuff about color fidelity, it's claiming 95 as its uh, CRI number, which is uh, basically you've got a, a color index number, so zero to 100, 100 being the best. 95's pretty good. The new Bron Color LED, which I'm gonna talk about shortly, is got 98.7, so that's very, very high. And that's also got, I think, uh, 12,000 lumen, so it's 10 times brighter uh, than this. But again, it's more about how can you modify the light? What can you do with the light to shape it, to change it? Your options are limited with this sort of thing. So that's what bothers me about this. I can't see I would have a use for something like this. Let me show you a little bit why. Here, for example, is a studio light. And if I take that out there, you can see that the light will emanate out of the bulb from all directions. So if I pop that on, you see the light is coming out everywhere. It's coming, it's not just coming out the front towards you like on that thing, it's coming out that way, that way, that way, that way, that way, every way imaginable. And that's really important because when, when we wanna pop a light like this into something like a parabolic reflector, the light has to emanate out in all directions for a modifier like this to actually work. 
Otherwise, you can't actually use a parabolic reflector with a light where it doesn't emanate out in all directions. So that's a key thing. And I said that to these guys. I said, look, these lights are just, you know, look at, look at what I shoot. Let's let, look, at the, look at the shots I shoot. So shots like this can't be done on a little light like this one. It's absolutely impossible for me to create the uh, sort of lighting needed, like this sort of sculpted three-dimensional light. It's absolutely impossible for me to create that with one of these because I can't modify the light. So if you need a little gizmo light as a little bit of fill in or a few hard edge lights here and there, great, but limited capability, I'm afraid, in terms of modifying it. Uh, what is good about it, as I said, it's got a fairly decent color index, 95. It's got variable color temperature, which is useful, and it's reasonably bright. It kind of reminds me of just a really, really good quality torch, but uh, there we go. Okay, so that's the Litra Pro. Now let's look at another LED light I saw, this one here. This is the new um, Braun. We saw this at um, Photokina. If you want to have a look at the review video, we filmed this at Photokina and showed you it live and got our hands on one. That video is on our YouTube channel, so you can look at that. But let me just tell you a little bit more about this, because I've not been a big fan of LED lighting, but this one looks like it might have some potential. So going back to what I said, here's the key thing. The light can emanate out sideways and every angle to 180 degrees from this light. This light is also 12,000 lumen, hugely bright. Color index of 97 with 98.6 at 5,500K, which is the key color temperature we need to concentrate on because that's daylight balance, like HMI lights or flash. This is also color temperature variable. So this light you can change from tungsten balance, warm light to daylight balance, cold light, and it's got an adjustable focus head. So the head pokes in and out so it can give you a slightly different beam inside different reflectors. So that light, which is going to retail apparently at about 1600 US dollars. Obviously one of these, much cheaper. This thing retails at about $270. So a big price difference, of course. That light though, the uh, Bron one, um, will be very usable in terms of studio photography. It seems that it would be uh, very good for video. It would be very good for stills photography, especially product photographers, and uh, potentially fashion and beauty as well, as long as it's not too bright in the model space. I've got a, a HMI light shining on me right now, a Para 133, and that's very bright, that light. And if I look at it, as, as a, you know, if I was the model, it gets a bit glary after a time. So this new LED light isn't as bright as that, so it might be a workable light. I'm looking forward to testing, and you guys will be the first to see my test, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to probably test this thing for color accuracy on a color checker card. I'm going to test the, LED, the Bron LED one, and I'm going to test it against um, actual flash light as well as maybe even HMI and we'll do a comparison on skin tones, uh, color checker chart um, and, and look at the results and we'll, we'll really get a good uh, idea on it. Right, a couple of questions coming in before I move on to uh, some of my next topics. Let me see. Um, Irish Tom says, would three 300 watt lights be good enough to start a portrait studio? Um, <coughs> Excuse me, yeah, in, in all honesty, probably would. Let me tell you why. Um, when we think about power of lights, so some of the most powerful monoblocks are usually around 800 watts, okay? So an 800 watt light um, is one stop more powerful than a 400 watt light. So what does that mean? Well, it means if you were shoot, able to shoot at F16 with the 800 watt light, then you'd have to shoot at F11 if it was a 400 watt light. So whilst it sounds like a big number change from 800 to 400, it's just a one stop jump, okay? So shooting at power 10 on an 800 watt light is uh, shooting at, like a power nine uh, on an 800 watt light would be equivalent to a 400 watt light on power 10. So it's just a one stop change. Now you don't have to drop the aperture uh, open larger to compensate. You could put the ISO up. So it's like changing from 100 ISO to 200. And the reason I say that this is more acceptable these days is because now cameras have higher 
ISO capabilities that are pretty clean. In the old days when I was shooting film, you know, we had to shoot on 64 ISO, sometimes even 25 OS ISO on Kodak TechPan. Um, but back then, you know, 100 ISO was the limit. You know, we would very rarely shoot on 400 ISO. Um, even on large format film. But now you can comfortably shoot on 400 ISO, 800 ISO even. So therefore, that means that lower wattage power or lower dual power lights are usable in many situations. Now I use 3,200 watt dual power lights, but I very rarely use them on 3,200 joules because it's a pack with three channels distributing 3,200 joules across those however you like it. Uh, so most of the time I find myself using the lights on power eight or seven. So on a 3,200 watt light, power nine would be 1,600, power eight would be 800, and power seven would be equivalent to 400. So you can therefore see, Tom, that 300 is just below 400, 200 watts would be one stop lower than 400. So you're half a stop lower than a 400 watt light. Uh, Kirstis Hustas, photography and video says, can you speak uh, about the difference between the Fuji GSX 50S sensor and the Hasselblad sensor? Same sensor, but the Fuji is 14 bit and the Hasselblad is 16 bit. Will you see the difference? Well, I believe the bit depth difference is part in the uh, processing. Um, I have not seen the Fuji camera, it's quite new. It does use the same sensor, which is a Sony sensor, which is the same sensor that's in the uh, 50 megapixel H650C uh, camera, as well as the X1D Hasselblad camera. Uh, obviously, for those of you uh, who may know, I'm an ambassador for Hasselblad, so um, you know I, I love their products, I use their products. One thing I can tell you, not having seen the Fuji, one thing I can tell you that Hasselblad do really well and they've done dedicated their entire lives to it is color fidelity and color accuracy. So it's one thing having the sensor and the sensor capturing the light, but it's what happens with the algorithms and the processing and the color manipulation and the way uh, that is dealt with. That is a key component. So you can give different companies like FaZe or Fuji or Hasselblad, the same sensor, and each company will get something out of it different. And one thing Hasselblad dedicate all their work to is image quality, image fidelity, especially in color accuracy. So the answer to that is, will you see the difference? There will be some difference. What it is, I can't say, because I haven't used or tested the Fuji. I have used the X1D, I have used, obviously I use a H6, and, and the color on that is superb, especially skin tones, fabrics, product, the sort of stuff that I do. The 16-bit thing is probably in the processing, not in the sensor. Um, so again, how, I, I don't know the technical, the technicalities of that exactly. I'm afraid you'll have to do a little bit of digging online. Um, Always convert your images to 16-bit though, even if you're shooting 8-bit. So if you shoot an 8-bit image, convert it to 16-bit in Photoshop before you do any retouching post-processing to avoid any banding and uh, degradation of the image during the retouch. Victoria Bowers says, what causes blue-purple lines around edges when using studio lights indoors and how can it be reduced? Sounds like flare to me, Victoria. So often if you're shooting uh, your subject and you've got some lights that are pointing in towards the camera, you can get a little bit of bleeding of light that tends to fringe a bit purple uh, around um, the edges of your frame. Now, if that's what you mean around the edges of the picture, if you mean around the edges of your subject, then sometimes that's chromatic aberration and that's actually just down to a poor quality lens and you can use the chromatic aberration correction tool in Lightroom to try and reduce it. But that is usually a red or a green shift around the edge. Sounds like to me what you're um, talking about is um, light f leaking in. Now what we use is a window mask, so it, you, a lens hood is basically designed to stop flare, but it, it's not good enough. So sometimes what I do is I take a piece of black card, I cut a hole out of it, the same shape as the sensor, and I position it the right distance away so that I can see my subject, and then it minimizes any light coming into the lens. You'll see that in some of our photography tutorials on Carl Taylor Education, how I use those, how I make them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They'll be in the portrait section, Victoria. Um, so dig into those, and uh, you'll see how it's used there. Shane Glenn says, hi, Carl, hope you're well. Outside model shoot, say an 80 centimeter softbox, deep 
or shallow for softer skins and why? Um, well, actually, it's all a bit hype, this deep and shallow softbox stuff. Um, all that matters is how the light is diffused when it uh, gets to the front panel. So if you imagine a softbox, here's your light, like I was just demonstrating. There's the light bulb. Where's the light coming out? It usually goes through a sheet of diffusion here and then another sheet of diffusion here. Some of the softboxes have a third sheet of diffusion to spread it even more. So it's all about how much spreading happens inside, bouncing off the silver on the inside, spreading through the first diffuser, through the second, and then how homogenous, that's how even the light is when it comes out the front. Because that's what a softbox is meant to be. It's meant to be a homogenous, even light source. So if you measured the light power at the corner, it should be about the same as it is in the middle or the other corner, and it's an even light source. Now, that's fine if you like that softbox look, but quite often, actually, I prefer the more concentrated beam light look of a parabolic reflector, even sometimes an umbrella where more of the light is actually focused to the center of your subject and then it falls away. Now, you wouldn't get that with a softbox, okay? So you need to understand the physics of light rather than thinking about, it sounds like you're sort of questioning like, will a deep or a shallow make a difference? The only difference a deep or shallow softbox will make is that potentially with a deep softbox, the light's got more opportunity to bounce around inside to diffuse better when it comes out the front. But you have to ask yourself, is diffused light coming out the front what I really need to make my picture pretty, okay? Because when you start thinking about where you're gonna angle the softbox, where you're gonna position it, the direction of the light, what you're trying to achieve, then a lot of those factors kind of go out the window and you may actually be better with a light that isn't perfectly homogenous. So about sculpting the light and understanding textural, textural gradation, those sort of things, dig into chapter one in the portrait section on Carl Taylor Education. That's our most popular chapter. I answer all the physics so that you can understand the fundamental principles behind lighting that then you'll know, you'll say, I don't want that softbox, I need this light because that's the light look I need. I want to create that type of emotion. So I need this particular modifier to do it. So I always think of lighting in terms of emotion. What type of emotion am I trying to convey? And then I just choose the appropriate tool to do that for me, okay? So that's how we should be thinking about light. Um, Cariel Rafudin says, how many bronze colors do you have? Um, <laughs> I've got quite a lot actually. <coughs> a ring flash, five Pico lights, seven bronze color uni lights, two Pulso G heads, uh, an array of para one. That I don't want to brag about it, but I've got a lot of lighting. HMI, we do video, we do large shoots. Uh, how many lights do I use on a shoot? Varies. Uh, let, me, let, let me just jump over a couple of shots here. So this light here is two lights. One light from the front, para 222, one fluter light on the back. Um, if I go to another simple lighting, this looks a really complicated lighting setup. This is a two light setup, only two lights used there. Uh, let me go to, this one is a two light setup. So not, uh, no, actually, sorry, that's not two lights. One light on the model, one light in the background, but three lights on that blue thing. So that's a more complex one. Um, if we jump to a really simple one, if I can find it, I think it's in the people uh, section. <coughs> in the people section, we have, where is it? Right, here's, here's one. So this is just one light on the model, one light only, and one light on the background. So that's about as simple as it can get, because it didn't even have a modifier on the light on her. I used a bare bulb light. So how complex it is and how complex it needs to be is um, uh, open to interpretation. Some of my uh, lighting setups require a huge amount of lights and sometimes they require very few lights indeed. It really does depend on what I'm uh, doing and what I'm shooting. Uh, right, uh, we're gonna take a couple, we're gonna take another question, then I'm gonna take a load more questions, but we will also, we're gonna take a look at uh, our sponsor for the show today. Now, the next question says, Mr. Ghost, did Profoto bugger up with the flat fronts on the B series lights in terms of modifiers when Bron color keeps the dome. Yes, Mr. Go I'm, uh, Ghost, I'm afraid they did. In my opinion, a flat fronted light is as useful as that, okay? It's just, it, it just does not make sense. This is what I don't understand, right? Profoto is a respectable lighting company that makes some good products, but a flat fronted light is essentially a speed light. <coughs> Whether it's round, excuse me, I've got a cough that I can't shake off. Whether it's a round flat fronted light 
or a square flat fronted light, it's essentially a speed light. It has a flat front surface. The only thing that can really diffuse into is a softbox really well. It's no good in a para, it doesn't work in a para. The physics do not work in, a, in an umbrella very well, in a parabolic light rev very well. So absolutely, uh, for me, for the most versatile type of lighting, I need a domed light. Now I have some lights, like the small Pico lights, which are flat fronted lights, but they are not designed to be used in a parabolic reflector or an umbrella. They're designed to be used with things like um, projection attachments or small beam Fresnels. In those instances, they're fine with those type of modifiers, but this all goes back to understanding the physics of lighting. And as I said to the other uh, chap, then uh, go and take a look at chapter one on Carl Taylor Education in the portrait section for a full understanding on lighting. Right, now I've got a, a whole bunch of other cool stuff to tell you about. But before I do that, before I do that, uh, let me just bring this up here. We, uh, we need to just say a quick uh, thank you to our sponsors. Now, for those of you who know, I use a Squarespace website. This is my Squarespace website and Squarespace sponsor our live uh, monthly or weekly shows here on social media. They make great website platforms uh, for photographers and many other uh, purposes as well. You can see this is my commercial site. The thing I love about the Squarespace sites is that I can load my images into them instantly. I can make changes to my website text. It's all very easy to navigate. Uh, we also have a offer code, Carl. Uh, which if you're buying a Squarespace website, then uh, use that offer code, Carl, and you'll get 10% off Squarespace sites, and they are very affordable. Uh, so thank you to Squarespace for uh, sponsoring this episode. Right, now, let's move back on to uh, some of the other things. My ops have come up with some good, cool stuff. <coughs> so there's two things uh, from my ops. There's this mobile dongle, which I think is really cool. This turns your phone into a uh, trigger, and it can be a, a time-lapse trigger, it can be an HDR time-lapse trigger, it can be um, a trigger, a sound trigger, it can do all sorts of stuff by using the power of your iPhone. And what that means is you can turn your phone into a sound trigger sensor, like some of the stuff I do where paint tins hit together and we use a sensor that, that senses the sound and it activates your camera. Now they've gone beyond that, because if we take a look back at their website, they've also done, this one's only $37 by the way, right? So for this gizmo to attach to your phone, so check that out on their website. But they've also got mobile remote. So they've got one that means you don't even need to have your camera connected to your phone. You can use your camera as a control unit for your phone remotely. So it means you could operate your camera from a distance via your phone using that one. So two new products there from um, MyOps, which look pretty cool. Now, while we were at Photokina, we also headed over to DJI, you know, the people that make the drones, because we're in the market for uh, a new Ronin, which is a big video camera stabilizer. And <coughs> Olivier there showed me some really cool stuff because on the Ronin for the video camera, they've got these separate remote modules that a, a director or operator would use with these turn wheels. And he can turn the wheels while the, the person just holds the rig and the camera turns and tracking and all sorts of cool stuff. But one thing he asked if I could point out on social media was about this photographer, Jan Arthur uh, Bertrand, very, very famous photographer. You'll recognize this work when you see these shots that I'm showing you now. This is Jan Arthur Bertrand. He's a French photographer. Now he shot a really famous book. We shot loads of famous books called Earth from the Air was one of his huge, sold 40 million copies. Um, he's done loads of films and movies and projects. And he uses these helicopters, charters helicopters, goes up and shoots from the air, obviously. That's his thing. That's what he does. But he's also now just partnered up with DJI. And there's a really cool video over on their channel, DJI Masters on the DJI channel. And uh, he's now getting into drone photography. So using some of the things like the DJI Inspire, the, the Phantom, <coughs> excuse me, um, he's using some of uh, their drones now to do some of his photography. And they're really proud to be working with him. So if you're a fan of his work, you want to check out more on that, go and check out that. Right, let's take some more questions here. What have we got? Uh, where am I? Oh, there's so many questions coming in. I'm not sure we're going to have time to get through uh, all of these. Uh, Quentin Aralt says, 
can we use the Broncal LED light as a flash? The flash duration should be good with the LED technology. No, you can't. No, the LED, LED lighting is a continuous light source, okay? The way a flash burst works is a trigger from a spark in a gas tube, and it can be very brief. LED lights have to like power up. Uh, hold on, I don't even know how to get it to turn on again. LED lights have to turn on and then turn off. And then, uh, so no, at the moment, I don't think the technology's there and it's certainly not there on any LED light I've seen. So they are a continuous light. And I suppose if you're gonna compare them to anything, they'll be comparable now to some of Broncolor's HMI lighting that they do because Broncolor have finally got the LED to be a very pure quality of light, albeit not as bright as the HMIs, uh, but still a uh, very bright light compared to one of those. Um, Tripitaka Wu, hi Carl, how can I let you evaluate my work? I'm a member of Carl Taylor Education. Uh, you can't, I'm afraid, trip Itaka. Not at the moment, but um, what we do do is we do members critiques. So we do several members critiques each year and we set a particular topic. I think the most recent one was fashion and beauty. And then we had uh, portrait before that. We've had product photography before that. And our members send their work in and I do a live critique over maybe four, six hours where I critique the work. I do some Photoshop uh, uh, work on the images and uh, I give pointers and advice on the images that are sent in. So that's really the only way we can do it at the moment. We may in the future be introducing some sort of mentor plan, but it will be a premium plan. And we will obviously let our current members upgrade to that plan if that's what they wish to have some sort of uh, further personal mentorship. But at the moment, only with our members' critiques. We do have coming up on our live photography show soon. Let's take a look at these live shows. Got some great live shows coming up. Tomorrow night, we're doing flat lay photography. So you know those really cool shots where you lay out pictures flat on boards and how to do that. We're doing pack shots on 23rd of October, product photography on the 30th of October. These are all live shows on Carlton Education. But we're also, we have uh, top uh, retoucher, Victor Fayesh coming in and he's gonna do a live retouching show. And we may invite our members to send in some of their beauty images. Um, Victor will choose one lucky image and he's gonna do a retouch on it. So that's another opportunity for our members to send their work in. John Georgia said, is there anything similar for Hasselblad like the pocket wizard for Nikon or Canon? <coughs> the pocket wizard. The pocket wizard was just a control unit for flashes as far as I can remember. It's just a trigger to trigger your flashes. So um, I cannot see why it wouldn't work unless you're looking for the high speed sync function. But if you're using a Hasselblad, you don't need high speed sync because you can sync at any flash speed or any shutter speed because it's a medium format camera. So because it's a leaf shutter, you can sync up to 2,000th of a second anyway. So you have no need for a pocket wizard for the high speed sync option if that's what you're talking about. If you're talking about simply to trigger the flashes, yeah, there's loads of flash triggers. Put them on top of the camera, like the, the, you know, the ones that come with each brand, you put them on top of the camera, click, bang, the flashes go off at the same time. But with medium format cameras like the Phase and like the Hasselblad, they sync at any speed because they're leaf shutter mechanisms where the shutter is in the lens. So you're not limited by a 200th of a second flash sync speed. You can sync to 2,000th of a second if you want. <coughs> right. Uh, Jeff Gothrow says, what do you think of the Broncolor Scope D50? I saw your segment with Oars at Photokina and was quite impressed by that technology. Um, yeah, I think it's got a lot of potential. Um, I mean, this thing is a, a mega, mega tool for museums and archival. Those of you that didn't see it, this is a, uh, a device um, that, let, I don't know if it's, let me see if I can find it. It's a device that uses 24, there it is, it uses 24 LED lights and you put the object underneath that dome thing. What did you call it, Ben? You called it like the X-Men helmet or something. So you put, it un un you put the object under it and then it uses mathematical computation. So it fires one LED light, takes a picture, fires another, takes a picture, and it builds up the shot out of these 48 or whatever lights. And then afterwards, you can mathematically control the lighting however you want. So you can set harder light, softer light, point light source here, move the point light sources if you're moving the light around. 
And I see in the future this is going to be huge because what's going to happen is this is going to evolve into the ability to take a product and put a product under there and then either soft light it from one side, hard light it. But at the moment, I, I think that the, the amount of LEDs will have to increase, the size of the scope will have to increase for it to be usable for product photography. But at the moment, it's got superb applications for um, museums and archival. So what they're doing is they get an artifact that they dig up out the ground, place it under there, it might have some tiny little writing in it or certain details, textures, fingerprints, and all that sort of stuff. And you can photograph it, you do the whole photograph circuit, and then you've got this computational uh, image, this mathematical model. You can send that file to other museums and universities, and then they can all independently study the object and move the lighting around and create harder textured light or softer light and different direction of light. So they don't have to ship the object to be photographed again once that one picture has been taken and it can even be taken on location into a laptop once that one shot's been taken then um, the ability is there to share that picture and let everyone look at that photo in any type of lighting they like so it's a huge um, bit of innovation from broncolor and uh, Truvis, which is um, they, they partnered with Basel, uh, uh, Basel uh, University, um, someone who was doing a PhD there. They, they partnered together on the technology to make this thing. Uh, it's not cheap. It's like twenty five thousand quid, um, which is about thirty five thousand dollars. But from a museum perspective, I think this is going to be a very useful scientific tool. It may well lead to being a very uh, useful product photography tool in the future. Who knows? But I think at the moment still you need that personal touch on things to do with composition and other aspects of it. So I'm not worried about losing my job just yet. Anyway, um, <coughs> Bahabani Sankar Mishra says, Hi Carl, I'm learning street photography. The streets here are either overcrowded. Can you suggest how to get good composition? I get too much clutter in the background. Well, you know what, actually? I know I'm, I'm guessing based on your name, you're either from India or Sri Lanka or somewhere similar. Now, I used to be in a previous life, many years ago, a photojournalist. So I used to do a lot of street photography in what I call reportage. And uh, a lot of that I did in very busy, overcrowded countries as well. But I always found opportunity um, if this picture will ever load there, always found opportunity to find photos um, when I was shooting this sort of stuff back in the day. This was back in the mid 90s. Um, and a lot of it was related to time of day. I mean, this one here, this one is actually in India. Uh, that's obviously India. This is in India. This is in India. And, and this is the time of day. Get up early. Get up when it's the best light. Sunrise, uh, sunset is not going to work for you. There's going to be loads of people around and that's good light. But sunrise is equally good light and far less people around. So I used to make uh, my effort to go around sunrise, look in the fish markets, the vegetable markets, the street vendors, early morning, beautiful light, haze in the air sometimes, dust in the streets and not too many people around. So that would be my advice to you. Um, Kim Johnson, hey Carl, if you wanted to shoot outside and you're on your own with no crew, the weather is windy and you wanted soft light, you don't want much, do you, Kim, and you wanted soft light, obviously you would not be able to use an umbrella because it would fly away. You could use a small soft box, but do you have a certain light shaping tool in mind which could output soft light and wouldn't get carried away by the wind? Um, well, think about what you said there, Kim, okay? You're almost asking for the impossible. To diffuse light and make it soft, you need a big soft um, panel of diffusion material, either a big soft box or a big scrim uh, to fire light through. There's no getting away from that. That's physics, okay? The only other thing you could do is bounce the light. So if there was a big building with a huge white wall, you could fire your flashlight into that white wall. That would create soft light if your subject was close to it. But if you're in the middle of a field or the middle of a desert, whatever, that's not going to happen. So I'm afraid there is no option. You either can't do it when it's windy if you've got no crew or you've got to have crew. Now, this whole thing about crew, this came up actually when we interviewed the wonderful fashion photographer Daria Belakova on our talk show the other week. And uh, she's got these amazing, amazing images. I mean, she uh, astounds me with her work. It's just beautiful stuff. 
And um, I'm just gonna see if I can bring up her website. So this is some of Daria's work here. And she does this, she goes out and she shoots, uh, you know, on location, these amazing elaborate sets in the breeze, in the wind. And we talked about this, about crew, you know, you know, you know, the people you need. And she said, oh, I'll just get some of my mates to help me out. Uh, so American people, a mate is a friend, okay? So I, I, I get some of my mates to help me out, just get a friend of mine, uh, you know, sh she'll hold this, or I'll have like a makeup, who's doing the makeup for me, she'll hold that. And she just says, she gets people together, you know, friends of hers that are interested in the whole project, the creativity, the photography, and they just come along for fun. So what I would say, Kim, is just try and make it more collaborative, okay? Try and see if you can get some people involved because I'm afraid there is no shortcut there uh, unless you can design and invent something. I mean, there's the other thing. When we did, we did a shoot in Iceland um, years, uh, well, say a few years back, I'll just see it. And we were working in horrendous conditions outdoors, um, like this stuff here. It was like super windy uh, and I had people holding lights and all sorts of stuff going on to, you know, to control uh, the lighting. Uh, this one here, where's it gone with the uh, waterfall? I've lost it now. Uh, there it is. So we had mist and we had rain and we had all sorts of stuff going on there. There's people holding lights. But even then, we sometimes when we didn't have enough people, we got a lighting stand and we put the parabolic uh, reflect uh, uh, modifier on it. And then we had four sandbags, huge sandbags holding the lighting stand down so it didn't blow over. And even then it was difficult. So even if you use sandbags and lighting stands, you still got to get to, you got to carry the sandbag. So that's going to be an impossible task. You're, you're really, I'm afraid, Kim, asking for the impossible. You cannot beat the laws of physics in terms of physical dimensions to soften light. And you cannot obviously stop the laws of the weather blowing a big object over like that. So you're gonna to have to find a way of uh, finding some people to help you or don't do it on a windy day. Um, Ong Korong says, how many staff are there in your studio? There are seven of us, seven wonderful people. No, I say six wonderful people because I'm one of the seven. So I can't call myself wonderful. Um, so there are six wonderful people who work here. If you'd like to see who they are, head over to carltaylereducation.com, scroll right down to the bottom and you will find the About Us page there in the middle. And on the About Us page, there we all are. There's me, Tim, John, Helen, Ben, Emma, and Ashley, all of their ugly faces, all put together on one page for you to adore, read their backgrounds, and read about them. So there are seven of us. Uh, Noel says, what kind of material do you use for your background? Uh, well, the material over there is a wall. This is a purpose-built studio cove, concrete floor, blends into a rendered, uh, so, you know, like you render the interior of your house with, uh, plaster, whatever it's called, into a rendered curve, up to plasterboard rendered and then it's all painted white. So it's like a, like a wall, a smooth wall that you'd find on the inside of a house, except it's got a curved bit that blends into the ground and blends into the concrete. <coughs> I wish I could get rid of this cough. I've had this cough for weeks now. Um, right, we haven't got much time. I'm gonna take a few more questions then we're gonna knock it on the head. We got so many questions coming here. Right, no more questions, no more questions. Let's see if I can get through some of these. Noel says, what kind of material? Oh no, we've answered that one. Uh, this guy has already asked a question. I'm not answering that one. Blagavest says about pro photo flat front. Is it make Godox make a better choice? Oh, I, maybe they do, I don't know. Martin Paul, why so many photographers interested in the amount of pics they take in a studio of getting one image right? Not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, I take a lot of pics sometimes. Um, if we look if I can find my website, I've lost it. Uh, I mean, give you an example. The, this photo here, I, I took a day and a half to get that right because of the water splashes and getting the splashes right. I think I shot over a thousand shots of me throwing water at that to get it right. So why is that important? Well, that's important to me because I wasn't happy with the result until I got that result. So I wanted to get that result. I had the lighting, everything set exactly how I wanted on the bottle, on the product, the background. But the unknown, the chaos theory part, was the water throwing. And that was only controllable to a, to a certain element, certain amount, but every splash was different. So why so many pictures? 
because I wanted to get the best picture. I'm working to pre-visualization. I'm making a picture, not taking a picture. Uh, if that's what you meant, not quite sure. David Riviera says, I have one question, Carl. That's good, because that's all you're getting, David. Uh, if you were to start this year as a photographer, knowing what you uh, would have to work over 15 years in your career and you wanted to specialize in fashion and beauty photography, if you were to start this year as a photographer, knowing that you will have to work over 15, oh, it, uh, other than studying, what would be your go-to advice? Um, well, it's a difficult one, David, because um, I knew it was going to be tough, right? I, I've been a photographer for over 20 years now. Uh, I've been running my own studio for 20 years, and then before that, I was a photojournalist uh, for several years. So I've been in this game for 25 years. And in between that time, I've also worked in professional dark rooms, printing, all sorts of jobs associated to the photography industry. And uh, now my main work is product advertising photography with a little bit of beauty and fashion and uh, stuff in there as well. The thing that I was lacking when I was learning um, is the subject of a live YouTube thing event we're going to do uh, talking about photography. But um, the thing I was lacking was knowledge. It was finding the right knowledge. Back in those days, you could only pick it up from other photographers, the odd book here and there. So I gained most of my knowledge by working for other photographers. And I always knew it was going to be diff difficult. When I started my business, my own studio in 1997, uh, late 97, uh, I was out of money for the first five years. Didn't have a penny to my name. I was paying off equipment loans and uh, all the rest of it. But I guess the thing is, I had ability and belief in my ability that eventually I'd get there. So I knew my work was good, or I thought my work was good, and I knew by just working hard I'd get there. What I didn't know was actually my work was pretty good, but it wasn't anywhere near as good as it is now because I didn't have a certain key aspects of knowledge. And what is available to you guys now? is that knowledge is available. So on platforms like ours, like on carltaylereducation.com and some other photographers that I respect uh, their knowledge as well, that knowledge is available to you at your fingertips. And it's that sort of knowledge that will make the difference to your work. The downside to that means that it's available to more people. Those that have got the knowledge, they tend to win. Their portfolio is better. They tend to shoot better work. They're gonna win better jobs. So if you've got the knowledge, great. But now more people have got the knowledge, so now it's a more competitive market. Uh, would I do it all again now? Yes, I would, because I love what I do. I mean, photography is my passion, so I enjoy my job. Uh, and I'm in a fortunate position that, you know, I came into the market in the film days, and it was still competitive then, but it's more competitive now, but I'm already established now. So, you know, that's a, a lucky position for me. I hope that answered your question. Um, Tian Nicholas. I love your education series. Could you please do a live show using a full frame 35mm camera to do a product shoot? Okay, we'll do that tomorrow night. All right, just for you, Nick Nicholas, TR Nicholas. So I'm going to shoot tomorrow night's live show on flat lay photography. I'm going to shoot it on a 35mm camera. There you go. Right, Phil Becker, any news on the 100 megapixel X1D? Mm, I don't know, Phil. I cannot say. <laughs> <laughs> Naf Salmani, hi Carl. I'm attending a fashion photography masterclass and Broncolor will be providing the lights on the day. I've never used them before. What setup would you recommend to begin with? God, that's a difficult question. It depends on what emotion you're trying to convey, Naf. There is no one light for all jobs. There is an assortment of modifiers based on the emotion you're trying to convey. Let's try and get that clear with you guys, okay? Let's try and get that real clear. Look at the emotion in that picture there. What do you feel? What does that picture tell you? What does it feel like? What is the emotion of that picture, right? Now look at the emotion in that picture. Does it feel different? Yes, it feels different, okay? But actually, the picture is the same set, it's the same swing, it's the same model, it's in the same studio, but it uses different lighting to create a different feeling, a different emotion, a different ambience. So fashion photography or any type of photography is all about emotion and the emotion comes from composition, yes, color theory, yes, aesthetics, yes, but it also comes heavily from the lighting. You have to have a fundamental understanding of lighting to get anywhere in this game. I cannot answer that question for you beyond you going and learning lighting on Carl Taylor Education. It costs $14, a bargain. I would have paid 
$14,000 for the information on there 15 years ago, I can tell you now. Danny Lantherlin, regards to your response to using LED light as flash, what do you think roto light claiming to be used as strobe? No idea, I've heard of roto light, uh, but I don't know the technology on their lights uh, as a strobe. Paul Cunningham, hi Carl, are you coming to Edinburgh? Um, probably not, Paul. Not that I've got anything against Edinburgh. I'd love to visit Edinburgh. But the question is the sort of logistics of it is like, if I go anywhere to do a workshop, if that's what you're indicating or meaning, is it's usually at the uh, request of people that I'm an ambassador for. So people like Manfrotto, Hasselblad or Broncolor, etc. They're the ones who organise the workshops. They usually organise them wherever they want to organise them for logistic and advertising reasons. Uh, we don't organise workshops at a per se in particular cities um, because that's not our thing. We do run workshops here out of our own studio though, uh, if you are interested in attending. Uh, if someone sets up a workshop in Edinburgh uh, one day, then we consider it. Um, Mesa Abdul, hi Carl. Um, I'm, so, I'm buying a couple of mono light heads from the same brand, but different models. I'm worried that the color temperature will be different. Well, it shouldn't be, not if it's flash, it should be fine. Pragnesh, what is the best camera for garment photography? That's a stupid question, I'm afraid. There is no best camera. Any camera these days will do a good job. The best camera would be the best camera. In my opinion, that would be the Hasselblad H6 100. I doubt you're gonna go and fork out for one of those just for garment photography. So use and buy the best camera you can afford. Mr. Lazyhead, hi Carl, when shooting flash for portraiture in bright outdoor ambient light, would you prefer using a HD filter over high speed sync? Yes, I probably would. High speed sync is too limited in the flash power level that you can uh, obtain. You're kind of limited to this high power output. But um, it actually in some of my tutorials, I demonstrate using um, a, a ND filter, not a HD filter, an ND filter, I think is what you meant to type there instead. Stephen Lee, what do you think about the new Godox b -Lock? No idea, never seen it. Uh, Niraj Loda, how can hobbyists know if he's good enough to pursue a career in photography? Um, I don't know, I guess be honest about your work. Look at some professional photographer's work, some proper professional photographer's work, hold your picture up, look at their picture and go, is mine as good? If it isn't, then it's not good enough. Next one, uh, Florian Hilt. Hello, Carl, I was watching the old edge videos I can't find back your technique uh, for fake water drop technique um, would you mind giving it back again uh, that that is in the advertising courses in the product courses um, so if you previously purchased our advertising products still life course it's in that course if not then it's on Carl Taylor education for $14 a month and you'll be able to find it within five minutes of registering for $14 Mr. Green, do you use polarizing filters or ND filters? I use both. Uh, Jason Crane, do you own any other t-shirts apart from Pretty Green? No, I do not. I love Pretty Green. I wish Pretty Green sponsored me. Pretty Green is owned by Liam Gallagher, I believe. And I like Oasis as a band, but I'm not that. That's not the reason I wear these t-shirts. I wear these t-shirts because I love the fit and the shape of their t-shirts. So I just buy loads of them. There you go. Um, Mark Davenport, have Sony Alpha 6000 being such a well-rounded camera? I'm not, I'm not even gonna read the rest of that question mark because it's a gear question. I don't know the answer. I don't know the sensors. I don't know anything about that camera. Christopher Stubbs, do you think there are certain cities where photographers need to be make it in fashion? Well, yeah, usually uh, to make it in fashion photography, it's London, Paris, New York, Milan, okay? That's kind of where it's at. That's just the sort of whole, hypocrisy of the fashion world and you've got to be in the major city, you've got to do the shoots. We're doing, hopefully, well, we're quoted for it, but we're doing a big shoot for a big celeb uh, in a week or two in London and we've got to shoot it in London, in a studio in London, because that's where the celeb person is and that's where we've got to be. That's the way it is with a lot of this stuff. Um, next question, hello Carl, your guidance on determining the power of the strobe which doesn't have TTL. Well, it's listed in what joules? So joules, 800 joules, 400 joules, 1600 joules. 800 joules would be a very powerful monoblock light. The highest power I can get out of my lights is 3200 joules. Sounds like a lot more, but it's just two stops more than an 800 joule. 800 doubled becomes 1600, 1600 doubled becomes 3200, so it's two stops more. Um, Daniel Medjewski, what's your opinion about Pro Photo versus Broncolor? Well, it has to be Broncolor. I mean, even if I answered that 
honestly, I can't answer, well, I can answer it honestly because I'm surrounded by Broncolor gear. That's the gear I decided to buy years ago when I switched from Elencrom. And then after that, Broncolor came to me about sponsorship and working with us and helping them with how-to videos. I love Broncolor gear. It's the best, most durable, most uh, variable modifiers and all sorts of highest quality kit there is. So Broncolor. Um, right, no more questions, I'm afraid. I've got a few more to answer. MM Shaggy says, notice you use Lightroom and then onto Focus. What are your thoughts about Capture One? Well, I actually use Focus most of the time because that's the tethered software I use with a Hasselblad camera. I use Lightroom sometimes if I'm shooting 35 mil, as we will on tomorrow night's live show. Uh, and uh, Capture One is really good. So I don't use it, but I've seen it and it is very good. Wayne Downey, will we see you at the Society's trade show in January again? Uh, probably not, I think, this time, Wayne. Borislav Dimitriov, hi Carl, what is the first I could do in order to find clients? Um, reach out to them. <laughs> I hate that phrase, reach out. Thanks for reaching out. Get these emails, right? Get these spam. Um, I'd like to reach out to you. I, that, no, that phrase didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, I just said it there though myself. Uh, you need to contact your clients is what you need to do, potential clients. You have to bang on their doors, knock on their doors, send them work. Uh, and just force yourself in front of them. But you've got to have good work to back it up. Our business course on Kyle Taylor Education tells you exactly what to do. Um, Morton Krogh Nikola Zazin, I believe I say that right. Hi, Carl. Is one better raw converter <coughs> better than Photoshop? No, they're all about the same, I think. James, hello, Carl. How much time do you approximately spend retouching one photo? That's a good question. So the photo that's on screen now, I spent zero minutes retouching it because it has no retouching, okay? Then um, other photos, that one, I spent about five minutes retouching because it only has some color and contrast adjustments to it. Uh, this, uh, wait a minute, this one I spent a little bit more time, a bit of burning and dodging, maybe about half an hour. Um, and then something like where this one, where I had to do a bit more work on the model skin because it's a beauty shot, then I might spend a couple of hours doing skin retouching. So it can vary anywhere between zero minutes, one minute to five minutes, to one hour to four hours, depends on the nature of the shot. I try to keep it minimal though. I don't believe in using a lot of Photoshop. I think Photoshop is just a, just a polishing tool. Uh, next one. Uh, la la la, Raj Kandwa says, I've seen many of your YouTube videos. What is the secret of the color in your pics? They're so re real, so vibrant and pure. Is it due to the camera or the editing? Um, I don't think it's due, I think it's due to the lighting. It's careful control of light and knowing how to control light. Not only the, the light and the color of the light, because the color of the light should be pure anyway, but it's also the, the, the way you modify light and the way you direct light. It all has a bearing on um, the image. If you imagine a bad photographer who just throws lighting on it here and there, and then the shadows aren't very good or the highlights are too bright, and then they try and pull all that back or lift the shadows up, and they're, they're just de destroying the color information in the process. So what I do is I light absolutely critically, exquisitely, uh, for clarity, for the shadows, for the highlights, for the midtones, and try to control my lighting and make it impeccable so that the uh, image needs minimal, minimal adjustment work. And that's, I believe, uh, the, uh, the, the impression of that sort of hyper-realistic uh, clarity that I get to my images. And thank you for saying so too. All right, uh, we're there. I think M Greenland, what conditions do you use either ND or polarizers, indoors or outdoors? I sometimes use polarizers indoors on product photography, generally outdoors, ND filters, sometimes in the studio if you've got too much light and you need to get, shoot full aperture, fully open, so an ND filter can help. But the Bron lights are really good because you can turn the light power right, right down. Um, so usually okay, but if you've not got lights that you can turn down low enough, or you're working outdoors and it's too bright and you need a longer shutter speed, that's when you'd use an ND filter. Juan uh, Co says, um, Sierra Martinez says, Carl, if you had not been a photographer, what other profession would you have developed? Be honest, do not say photography. I would have been a diver. 
um, I dive, scuba diving, um, technical diving, wreck diving, documenting shipwrecks, and uh, I love diving for scallops and shellfish and stuff. So I, I, I guess I would have liked to uh, be a dive instructor or diver or archaeologist diver or something like that. Um, stop sending me questions, Emma. We're done. Um, right, OK. Uh, next one, Tracy Freeman. Best graduated filters uh, for me. They come from that brand there called Lee, Lee Filters. I use Lee Filters, OK? There are lots of good brands of filters, but I've been a Lee filter user for a long time. Uh, Niraj Loda, is, this is the last question. Is there going to be a review session again? And by that, do you mean a critique? And then the answer is yes, we will be doing lots of those and lots of those throughout 2019. Right, thank you very much for listening. Thank you again to Squarespace for sponsoring the show. Remember, we're going live on Carl Taylor Education tomorrow doing flat lay photography, teaching you the tips, the tricks, the lighting, the angles of view, everything you need to know, lens choice, camera, all that stuff. We're doing pack shot photography on the 23rd of October. We're doing uh, footwear photography on the 30th of October. And in November, I've got live retouching show with Victor Fayesh and a talk show with Victor. And uh, we got handbag product photography. And I've got Anna, the food photographer, wonderful food photographer coming back to us soon as well to a whole load more food photography modules. So we've got tons of amazing stuff going over on carltaylereducation.com. If you haven't checked out carltaylereducation.com platform, get over there, get your knowledge, upskill yourself, invest in yourself, get over there and check out what we've got to offer. I'm Carl Taylor. Thanks for tuning in to this Carl Taylor social media live episode. We'll see you next time.